So thanks very much to the organizers for inviting me. I got a slightly different request, apparently, than everyone else did. Uh, I was asked to give a bit of a review lecture. So I'm going to do that, but I'll also kind of focus on a particular paper at the end. So I'll try to uh, get the best of both worlds. So, um, whoops, is this thing not going to go? Tricks? I'll stop working. OK. <laughs> well, that explains it. Um, so uh, let me begin with just two facts that will motivate the paper that I'll ultimately get to. First, as someone said, maybe it was Chris, US households do remarkably little saving in liquid financial assets. When you look at households that are in the 65 to 74 age group uh, and look at their median financial wealth, and that includes everything, IRAs, 401ks, checking accounts, savings accounts, stocks, bonds, et cetera, it's $68,000. Secondly, uh, there's a lot of leakage in the retirement savings system in the U.S. For every dollar that goes, for every two dollars that goes into the system, uh, about one dollar leaks out, uh, and this is to households under age 55. Uh, and so the question that I'm going to come back to in the end is, is the U.S. retirement savings system optimal? Uh, now, the framework I'm going to think about is present bias discounting, which is obviously just kind of one angle on this very big question. Uh, and um, just to quickly review, that framework assumes that current utils get full weight and future utils, even utils maybe a week away, get weight beta times delta to the tth power, where t is the horizon. Here I'm writing out the utility function um, in a separable form. And you can see that if I partial out the beta term, it's just standard exponential discounting with a beta downweighting uniformly all future utils. Now, there's a lot of predictions that flow from this beta delta framework, and this kind of gets to a lot of the issues that have been on the table earlier today about normative stuff and about positive stuff. Let me quickly review these predictions, and then we'll talk about a few of them in a very selective lit review. So households will have very few liquid assets. They'll be hand-to-mouth uh, households. Households will have, however, substantial illiquid assets. Whatever wealth they accumulate will end up being in, in illiquid form. Households will have a very high MPC out of cash on hand. Uh, exactly the earlier paper. Uh, so whether it's predictable and unpredictable liquidity shocks, or predictable and unpredictable income, or predictable and unpredictable liquid wealth, all of those kinds of liquidity are going to generate very high consumption elasticities. On the other hand, households will have very low MPCs out of illiquid wealth. And that just follows mechanically from the first point. If you've got very little liquid wealth, and I shock your illiquid wealth, well, there's no margin on which to adjust. So there's very little responsiveness there. And finally, the choice architecture of savings institutions will make a very big difference. Opt-in versus opt-out, ease of enrollment, all of these things are going to drive kind of very powerfully, powerfully the behavior of these agents. So let me quickly go through some evidence. Uh, first, hand-to-mouth behavior. This remarkable uh, survey result from Lestardi and Tufano. I don't see Anna here. Um, uh, I know she was here earlier. So how confident are you that you could come up with $2,000 if an unexpected need arose within the next month? Uh, remarkably, only 47% of U.S. households say that they could come up with $2,000 uh, in the next month. Uh, very high MPCs out of predictable income movements. Paper by Jesse Shapiro. Uh, for food stamp recipients, caloric intake declines predictably by 10 to 15% over the course of the food stamp month. To explain this, you'd need an exponential discounting model uh, with an annual discount factor, not a discount rate, discount factor of 0.23, implying an annual discount rate of 147%. Similar results from Master Buoni and Weinberg in the Social Security domain. For households that have lots of liquidity, they smooth. For households without liquidity over the food stamp month, over the Social Security month, there's a 25% uh, reduction in caloric intake uh, during that month. Now let's turn to some life cycle simulations. My own work uh, with Mario Sangelatos um, and others, um, we have the kind of standard model in which you throw in all of the structural elements, as many as you can possibly handle, given the limitations of computer speed, mortality, dependence, retirement, various educational groups, stochastic labor income, all calibrated from the PSID, a credit limit. So, And here I want to emphasize these models, I don't really see them as competitors with the Deaton Carroll framework, uh, we're really just taking those frameworks and adding beta delta to it. So it's really one and the same. We're adding one additional ingredient, and we critically rely on these credit limits to drive the mechanisms. State variables, liquid and illiquid wealth, income, and two choice variables, liquid and illiquid wealth investment. 
Well, we see, and now let's talk about preferences in these models. So we'll uh, look at this framework with constant relative risk aversion of two. And we'll look at both exponential agents and hyperbolic agents. And we'll think about these kind of as separate economies and ask what do they look like if everyone's exponential or everyone's hyperbolic. So for exponential economies, beta equals 1, delta equals 0.94, or a 6% discount rate. And that 6% discount rate is calibrated to match observed wealth formation. So we're looking at wealth between ages 50 and 59 to calibrate that 6% discount rate. For hyperbolics, we're going to assume a 30% short run discount rate and a 4% long run discount rate. And that's also calibrated to match the observed levels of wealth formation. So what do we see when we simulate these models? This is for households with a high school education. So I'm showing you here the exponential household. Uh, let's see, is this thing going to actually do this? Oh, it does that. Uh, for households with, with uh, an exponential in the exponential economy, we see that 73% of households in the simulations have at least one month of income in liquid assets. For hyperbolics, it's much lower, and the data is much closer to the hyperbolic number. For the mean level of liquid assets to total assets, in the exponential simulations, we see that that mean across households is a half. In the hyperbolic simulations, it's 0.39. And in the data, it's 0.08. And this is this remarkable fact that American households, by and large, don't have liquid assets uh, on their balance sheet. They're in debt um, in terms of their liquid wealth. The percent of households with revolving credit, exponential simulations, 19%. Hyperbolic, 51%. In the data, 70% uh, in this group with only a high school education. Mean credit card borrowing, exponential models, $900. Hyperbolic models, $3,400. And in the data, it's hard to actually get a handle on this, but at least $5,000 per household. That data, well, this is a paper from 2001, so that data is in the 90s. It would be higher now. Um, uh, and the MPC out of predictable movements in income, and here I want to make a kind of important quantitative point. When you look at the exponential model, yeah, you, you, know, you get MPCs that are not zero. The classical model says it should be exactly zero. But the point is they're still very small. And in the data, uh, they're much higher. We can debate whether it's 23% or 30% or 40% or 50% if you look at Jonathan Parker's, uh, some of his estimates. Um, uh, but the key thing is that quantitatively, we've got to be up here. And even though these exponential models take us away from zero, they don't take us far enough. Now, of course, I can raise the discount rate and make this higher and higher. But if I make the discount rate high enough to raise this MPC, I'm going to pay the price by lowering wealth accumulation. And I can't have both in the exponential world, a high MPC on average in the population and high levels of voluntary wealth accumulation. Now, we can also use an MSM, a method of simulated moments approach, to estimate these parameters. I'll kind of skip over the moment list for lack of time, but it's similar to the list we saw before. When we do that, we get a beta estimate in an MSM framework of 0.7 and a long run discount rate of 0.04 or a delta of 0.96. Okay, and the intuition is very simple. Your short run discount rate drives all that credit card borrowing and all of that spending of liquid wealth. That short run discount rate is 30%. So in the short run, you look like a really impatient agent. And yet, your long run discount rate is only 4%. So your long run behavior is socking money away into accounts where you hope the money will survive all the way to retirement. As we'll see later, that's often not the case. Now, that gets to us this issue of commitment. There's lots of work now in the beta delta world about how people tie their own hands. And I wish I could tell you about all these great papers. I'm going to pick out a few uh, to focus on the paper that I'm going to ultimately tell you about uh, at the end of the talk. So one of the key early papers is a Shroff, Carlin, and Yin. They offer a commitment savings account to Philippine customers. 28% of the people offer the commitment account, uh, take it up. They're basically not going to have access to their money uh, until the individuals reach a date-based goal or an amount-based goal. Uh, and they find that the people with more present bias are more likely to take it up. There's Jine, Carlin, and Zinman. This is Jonathan's paper right here in the front row. They're looking at a voluntary commitment account to get people to quit smoking. Among the, and the way it works is you give the researchers your money, and then you get tested for nicotine and cotinine in your bloodstream at the end of the study period. And if you're positive, you lose your cash. They find that the smokers who are offered this product have an 11% take up rate. And if you look at all the people who are offered the product randomly selected and all the people who are not offered the product randomly selected, 
and again, this is intent to treat, you find that those who are just offered this product have a three percentage point higher uh, quit rate. And that is sustained at a 12-month follow-up. There's a paper by Cower, Kramer, and Mullinathan where they do something kind of totally counterintuitive, remarkable. They go to an uh, Indian uh, peace rate factory and they tell workers, look, we'll pay you half your normal wage up to a target level of production that you, fit, that you pick, dear worker. And then if you reach your target, we'll pay you a lump sum and get you back on your old wage schedule. And then you'll keep getting your normal piece rate after that. So would you like to get this dominated pay schedule where you get half your pay up to the target and then you reach back to your normal pay schedule? And they find that despite the fact that this is dominated, 35% of the individuals take this up. And the effect on productivity is the same as being offered um, uh, Oh, it increases production by 2.3 percentage points, which turns out to be equivalent to a very large pay increase. Uh, and this obviously is kind of for free for the employer. So let's turn to the paper I want to talk about now, which is what are the features of liquidity that make savings contracts or savings systems desirable? Or what are the features of illiquidity? In a beta delta world, in a present bias world, having illiquid assets might actually be better. Um, so what would be ideal? We live in a 401k world or IRA world here with a 10% penalty for early withdrawal. What's the ideal system? 10%, 20%, a completely illiquid retirement system, what should we have? So now let me ask you all to be subjects. Imagine I gave you 500 real dollars, this is what we do in the experiment, uh, and I asked you to allocate that money across two accounts, a liquid account with a 22% rate of interest and a goal account with also a 22% rate of interest. You're a real subject. What are you going to do? The goal account has one special feature. There's a goal date that you pick. And before the goal date, there's a 10% penalty for early withdrawal from the goal account. After the goal date, you can have your money gratis. So the goal account, from a classical perspective, is completely dominated. It's simply an illiquid version of the freedom account. The illiquidity is of your own design. You pick a goal date. Would anyone in this room put a dollar on the goal account? Well. Maybe you would. <laughs> this is what our subjects do. Uh, about 85% of the subjects put some of their money in the goal account. 85% of the subjects. But we're economists. We don't care about subject weighting. We care about dollar weighting, probably. So let's ask, how many of the dollars in the study, these are experimenter-generated dollars, how many of the dollars that we give our subjects are allocated to the goal account? Answer, 35%. But then we do another arm of the study with different subjects drawn from the same population. And in this case, we tell the subjects, the goal account has a 20% penalty for early withdrawal. And the freedom account is as it was before. But these are different subjects, so they're not making a comparison. They're not, they're kind of uh, facing this in a novel way. Do you think that the increase in the penalty lowers or increases subjects' propensity between subjects to put money in the account? Does a higher penalty pull them in or drive them away? It pulls them in. Now we see a 43% dollar weighted allocation to the goal account. What about a third arm of the study? Where again, drawing subjects from the same population, different subjects, we give them a choice between two accounts. A goal account that is now completely illiquid before your goal date, and a freedom account that's perfectly liquid. Again, they have the same interest rate. Does making the goal account even more illiquid pull them in or drive them away? pulls them in. Now we were kind of amazed by this, even though it matched our hypothesis. Uh, so we did a follow-up experiment where we do the exact same design uh, and we have different arms in this case. Our framework now has four arms. Arm one is going to be a 10% penalty before the goal date. Arm two is a no withdrawal um, penalty account before the goal date. Uh, and these are replication arms. And then we added a third arm in which we have a three-way horse race. So in the, all the other arms you've seen, it's just two accounts, a freedom account and a goal account. In the third arm, it's going to be three accounts, a freedom account, and then a 10% penalty goal account, and a perfectly illiquid goal account. So now they're allocating across three arms. We have a direct head-to-head -head horse race between these two kinds of illiquid accounts. And then a safety valve account where we said to the subjects, uh, there's no withdrawal before the goal date, except in the case of a financial emergency, as determined by you, dear subject. So you get to make up your own mind as to whether or not it's a financial emergency and then have your money accordingly. Here are the results. With the 10% penalty arm, we see 46% of the money allocated. <clears throat> this is now out of $100. 46% of the money allocated to the goal account. With the no withdrawal arm, 
we see 54% of the money allocated to the goal account, and that difference is significant at the 5% threshold. When we offer our subjects two goal accounts and the freedom account, we see that half of the money, 50%, is allocated to the goal accounts, to across the two goal accounts, and the breakdown is 16% goes to the 10% penalty account and 34% goes to the no withdrawal account. Our safety valve account attracts 45% of the money in the study. Let's turn to theory. So we're going to generalize Amador, Werning, and Angelatos's uh, 2001 Econometrica paper, and I'll refer to it hereafter as AWA. That paper has the following three critical ingredients. It has present bias preferences, it has short run taste shocks, and it has a general commitment technology. Here's the timing. There's an initial period in which a commitment mechanism is set up by self zero. In period one, a taste shock theta is realized and privately observed by the agent, not the planner, and consumption C1 occurs. In period two, final consumption occurs. Here are the preferences. These are now familiar. The only change from what you've seen before is that now we have a taste shock occurring uh, in period one. We could add that to period two, but it wouldn't change the analysis. So to keep things simple, uh, we'll leave it out. Here's the general technology for commitment, and this is a very general technology. Uh, if subjects or if the agents in the economy gave themselves maximal flexibility, they would simply say, you can, I can consume as much as I want in period one, I can consume as much as I want in period two, give themselves the maximal budget set. Or they can create some kind of constrained budget set to incent themselves in the future to consume the right amount. And again, these structures are being set up at date zero to incent the consumption behavior of selves one and selves two. The interpretation, we're going to basically put a restriction on this, keeping in mind the US 401k IRA system. We're going to imagine that the slope be no steeper than minus 1 over 1 minus pi, which means that when $1 is transferred from consumption at date 2 to consumption at date 1, no more than pi dollars are lost in the exchange. Think of this as kind of a maximal penalty for early consumption. In the US, it's 10% right now. Now, it'll turn out in the analysis that follows, in the theorems that follow, that with all that flexibility, they could pick any constrained budget set in red. They're going to turn out to want to pick a particular budget set, which is this two-part budget set, where in essence, it's as if the agent puts C1 star in a liquid account and C2 star in an illiquid account with the maximal penalty pi. So that'll turn out to be their endogenous optimum, despite the enormous flexibility that they have. Here are the theorems. Assume constant relative risk aversion utility uh, and assume that early consumption penalty is bounded above by pi, this policy making variable. Then self zero will set up two accounts, a fully liquid account and an illiquid account with the maximal penalty. Theorem two, assume log utility, though in fact it, we can make this much more general. Uh, well, sorry, using simulations we've shown that it's much more general. We don't have the theorem uh, in the general case. But assuming log utility, uh, the amount of money deposited in the liquid account rises with the early withdrawal penalty. That should remind you of the results that we saw before uh, as we went down this list. The allocation to the illiquid account rises as the penalty in the illiquid account increases. Theorem three, and this is just re reproducing the key result from AWA that we're building off of in all of our analysis. Assume self zero can pick any consumption penalty, then self zero will set up two accounts a fully liquid account and a fully illiquid account that admits no withdrawals at all in period one. So this is a kind of radically different pension scheme than the one that we have in the US. This one has, this optimal system has no liquidity in the intermediate period. That admits a corollary. Assume there are three accounts, one liquid, one account with an intermediate withdrawal penalty and one account that is completely illiqu illiquid give agents this three account system and ask them to allocate money across the three accounts, what will they do? The theorem, the corollary is they'll allocate all the money to the liquid account and the perfectly illiquid account and no money to the intermediate account. That's not exactly what we see. Uh, we see, in fact, that the intermediate account in our experiment absorbs 16% of the money and we see the other two accounts being far more popular. Lots of open questions about what this experiment means and about confounds. I hope we'll talk about them during the discussion section. But let me turn to extensions and actual design issues vis-a-vis -vis US pension systems. What are the implications for a retirement saving system in practice, kind of going beyond this stylized setting? There are three things we need to do. 
we need to allow penalties to not just take money away from agents, but transfer money across agents. The AWA framework assumes that all penalties are just burnt. I take the money away from you, and I you know, take the resources away, and I crush them and destroy them. In the real world, when I penalize one agent, Raj, I give it to another agent, Bob. Uh, and as a consequence, those transfers have to be taken into account. We also want to take account of heterogeneity and sophistication and heterogeneity and present bias. So um, it'll turn out that I'll actually want to have penalties in this new world where I can make transfers because penalties create positive externalities. And when we solve the model in this setting, AWA's result breaks down. So let's take a look at uh, a formal version of this. The government's going to pick an optimal triple, XZP. X is the amount of money in the liquid account, Z is the amount of money in the illiquid account, and P is the penalty for early consumption. Um, we'll have a budget constraint such that all of the resources given out to agents, X plus Z, the liquid account and the illiquid account, sum to the exogenous resources in the economy and the penalty chosen by the planner uh, multiplying the equilibrium level of withdrawals in the economy. And what do we get? We get optimal penalties now that don't look like these infinitely high penalties I showed you before. Uh, now we see that the optimal penalty for constant relative risk aversion of 2 or constant relative risk aversion of 1 with a beta value of about 0.7 is only in the 30% range. So we're getting kind of modest penalties, far higher than the 10% penalties we see in the US, but not the infinite penalties that we derived earlier. However, two key properties emerge, and the story's going to take one more turn before I stop. Um, so first, the optimal penalties in this world almost eliminate withdrawals. They're so severe, the optimal penalties I just showed you, the 30% penalty for early withdrawal, that agents essentially don't consume early in this economy. They do in very extreme events when they get very large taste shocks, but most of the time, almost all the time, they're not consuming early. Secondly, the welfare losses for agents in this economy are in 1 minus beta squared. Not a big surprise there. That may be a kind of familiar uh, Harburger-like result. Uh, so which means that we should be most worried societally for the low beta agents, the po people with the most present bias. They're the ones that we should really be focusing on when we design savings institutions. Let me show you that now quantitatively. If I'm showing you the optimal penalty for an agent um, with a beta of 0.6, well, the optimal penalty is here. This is utility on the vertical axis. And you can see that setting the penalty a bit too high doesn't hurt him that much because he's really at a point where he's not going to consume much out of the illiquid account anyway. But if I set the penalty too low, it's a disaster for this agent. Here's a more extreme version. Here's a beta of 0.1, an agent with a 90% short run discount rate, an extreme myope. Well, here's their optimal penalty. It's nearly 100%. And if I set their penalty too low, it can be a disaster for them. If I set the penalty too high, it really doesn't matter. Here's a picture of all the agents in the economy spread across betas of really low betas, 0.1, that's like a 90% discount rate, all the way to beta 1, that's an exponential discounter. And you can see for the exponential discounters, or people who are nearly exponential at the top of the slide, Setting the penalty higher or lower just doesn't matter that much for them. Whereas for the agents that are highly myopic, their penalties need to be really high to get them to consume optimally. And if I set the penalty too low, I really screw them up. So we see here a kind of an emerging lesson. I don't have a theorem for you. Penalties that are too low are really damaging for low beta agents. But penalties that are too high are barely damaging for high beta agents. Equilibrium implication, normative implication, the optimal penalty is going to be a very high penalty in an economy with diverse agents, diverse or heterogeneous on this beta parameter. So to paraphrase Lucas, once you start thinking about low beta households, nothing else matters, little macro joke. Um, consequently, very large penalties are optimal if there is substantial heterogeneity in beta. Let me now show you this numerically. Let's have the government pick an optimal triple. A liquid account, deposit x. An illiquid account, deposit z. And a social equilibrium pen a penalty for our retirement system, p, a penalty for early consumption. We're again going to have budget balance. Total resources, x plus z, must equal 
uh, total government resources, one plus the penalty times the expected withdrawal amount. We're going to let beta, this present bias parameter, be uniform from 0.1 to 1. It'll turn out in this case that the expected utility basically is increasing in the penalty almost to 100% penalty. In essence, 100% penalty is the optimal penalty for the retirement saving system in this economy. So, conclusions. Our three-period model and experimental evidence imply that optimal retirement saving systems have highly illiquid retirement accounts. Now, obviously, this is a wildly speculative claim. I mean, this little bit of evidence and this little bit of theory won't convince anyone, certainly not me and not you either, uh, that we should change our retirement saving system. But it's food for thought, I hope. Um, the good news is that almost all countries in the world have a system like this, a public social security system plus a completely illiquid supplementary retirement account system. So don't think 401ks are the, national, are the international norm. Everywhere else in the world, 401ks, DBs, the whole system is basically completely illiquid. Unfortunately, we're the exception. Uh, and while this work doesn't teach us that we need to abandon ship, I hope it starts a conversation about the optimality of the very flexible and highly prone to leakage U.S. retirement savings system. Thank you. Did I go over? I... Oh, you're perfect. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry for going so fast. Um, David, I assume a lot of this uh, result comes from the fact that the, sophistic that the low uh, beta guys just push everything into liquid stuff, right? So they, they don't really care about these sort of high penalties because the way they'll shift wealth is just put a lot of it into liquid stuff. But, not, but in the retirement system in the U.S., the, illic the, the savings penalty stuff is also tax subsidized. Uh, in your model, it's not. So I think that's why the beta, the low beta, the, I guess, the not present oriented guys don't really care that much. But if you give them, if you give the returns to these penalty accounts, you make them higher with a subsidy, I assume that they'd lose quite a lot of utility because it's got a higher expected rate of return and we wouldn't get this 100% result. Right, so, so what the, in essence the model says that we shouldn't be thinking about it, I mean you're kind of thinking about it as a partial equilibrium problem. Those tax subsidies are endogenous. They're part of the policy decision. So to the extent that we set those tax subsidies, and by the way, we don't need to subsidize these savings to get them to occur. We can, we can in some sense, punish people for not doing the saving. In, the, in a, many countries, increasingly, it's just mandatory saving. Think about Australia, think about Singapore. Um, think about all of the DB systems in Europe. It's not really a choice variable. So what this theory tells us, and granted, it's just a theory, is that we should be less focused on creating things like matches and tax breaks for 401k saving. I think I'm probably echoing things that Raj may talk about later, and more focused about uh, getting money into these accounts through mandatory contribution systems like Australia, um, and then penalizing very heavily or maybe completely early withdrawals. But if, uh, I, would, I would bet that your 100% result goes away if you force people to save a part of the stuff in the illiquid stuff. Oh, oh, that, that is the front. I'm sorry, that is the model. You force people to? Well, well, it, or can they choose to put a bunch of it in the liquid thing? So, so, so the, the planner, mm -hmm. I'm sorry I went so quickly, the planner picks X and Z. Now, I could easily endogenize that, but the planner would just incent people to put the money in by saying, uh, if you don't put in the exact amount I want you to put in, I'm going to tax you $100,000 <laughs> or whatever, <laughs> whatever your wealth is. So, so I could have done it with incentives. But it turns out that that's just, uh, you know, that, that, that's vacuous. Because whether I do it with incentives or whether I make it mandatory, it's the same theorem. <laughs> I have two questions. One is, uh, I was wondering to what, to what extent it is US specific. I mean, you mentioned many other countries, but if I look, for example, at Germany, I grant you there's this uh, DB system, but most of the world is held in nominal liquid claims. It's much less extreme than in the US. It's one, I mean, I think I would like to see more, you know, particular other countries in, uh, in Europe. The second thing is you push very much preference distortions. 
Have you thought about belief distortions as well? Is it the case that you know certain people are just more optimistic what the future income will be and they are overly optimistic? And would you get different uh, results depending whether it's a preference distortion or a belief distortion? So I, I, I like both of those questions very much. I agree that we need to figure out to what extent these are US facts and to what extent these are world facts. Um, and that research is an important, important margin. Um, I think there's many, many behavioral biases that are confounded and look a lot like present bias but are not present bias. And so I think you're right that there's things like myopia and belief distortions that end up appearing to many of us to be present bias, but we're actually mislabeling them. So I think a full account would separate all of those effects and think about optimal policy in that integrated framework. Now, I'm going to speculate that a lot of the other effects are going to end up with the same prediction that you want to basically tell people you got to save and you can't take the money out early. Um, but that work has to be done. So this is a comment I've made in at least 17 conference presentations from the very beginning when you were a graduate student. But uh, since you haven't responded to it, I have to repeat it. <laughs> <laughs> that is that the, the, the mentality that you have in mind is, ex except for these restricted entities that you're talking about, um, that I know I should save and I'll get started saving next period. Um, but there is a group, the beta greater than one group, that includes quite a few friends of mine. I don't know whether that's uh, how widespread it is, but that's a research question. It certainly includes me. Um, and those people say, I know I should consume, and I'll get started on it next year. Uh, and then you just see this mindless. And of course, when you look at the wealth distribution, I think that uh, you, that, that can generate a, a quite a bit of wealth. Um, uh, and and that ought to be brought into this because I, I think that's the other side of the coin. But I've, I've been had zero success in getting, you know, your distribution uh, had its maximum of eight equal one, but it should go up to about one point three. <laughs> so, uh, you know what? You moved me. <laughs> I'm going to add <laughs> one point one to the distribution. That's right. It won't <laughs> exactly. It's not going to change the result. But but yeah, there are some people with beta greater than one, and they're the people who are perpetually not taking their vacation and perpetually working too hard, probably everyone in this room. Um, and they do represent a shockingly high fraction of the wealth formation in the world and a shockingly low fraction of the consumption in the world, case in point, us. Um, so uh, I do think that if we're worried about wealth formation, if that's you know the worldwide capital stock, then the beta greater than one folks should be our focus, or at least part of the focus. And if we're worried about consumption, then we can essentially ignore them. Yeah. But right, and you know, what have you done on your last vacation? Probably what I did. Yeah. Brought my computer along and <laughs> worked every night until 4 a.m. <laughs> so uh, I'll maybe I'll end the monopoly of the microphone at this table, but I just wanted to uh, push on one point. I'm very sympathetic to everything you're saying. So you, you have this result, which is quite interesting, that when you, when you let the guys basically have the money in case of a financial emergency that they define whatever it is, it would seem like in the standard beta delta framework they should not take that up because they can obviously, they, they realize, oh, my future self will call anything a financial emergency. Um, and I wanted to push that point in addition to this general point, which I didn't understand in the model, which we were kind of debating. Oh, but they, the they table. don't pay a penalty in that case. I should have been clearer. So oh, they will still pay a penalty. Th no, they won't. Right, right. That's what I'm saying. So in that case, that seems like you've completely undone the commitment yeah. on the future self. There's no cost to it. Right. Um, so, so. And, th and that leads to my other question, which we were debating at the table. I didn't understand how we think about really true negative shocks in which I really regret having p imposed this withdrawal penalty on myself in the modeling you did. I, did. I don't know if that's assumed away or we don't think about what those shocks are, or maybe I just use my liquid account and I can solve that problem. No, I didn't no. get that. Those are, real, those are real problems for these agents. Here's the, every now and then, they get a theta shock that is really high. And so they have a really high marginal utility for money. You know, someone's going to break my knees if I don't get them, don't get the cash to that guy. But then I find it surprising you get the 100% being, I, I don't know, it seems like maybe the distribution's not, it seems surprising that you would get 100% in that world. Distributions are very general. They're, doesn't, you can't do it for all distributions, but in essence, for all the distributions that you would think of sitting here in 10 minutes. So the qualitative is just that the marginal utility is not high enough to compensate me for all that lost margin. Uh, lo right, that. But remember, X and Z are endogenous. So if there's a lot of mass in these extreme events, then endogenously, 
either the agent or the planner puts very little money into Z. So the result is not that I see, the so amount yeah. in Z is fixed and the penalty keeps getting higher. The result is that, yeah. That makes sense. Um, my question is uh, somewhat related um, to Emmer's question. Uh, the, the, uh, first of all, I should say I love this paper. I love this um, set of points um, that you made. Um, I'm uh, curious, though, about how robust they are to two things. Uh, one of them is if the theta were inside instead of outside the U, uh, then you certainly would not get a 100% penalty because um, if you got a large enough uh, l or small enough value of theta, then you're, you know, approaching positive infinity marginal utility. Uh, so you would not ever uh, choose something like 100%. Uh, and, I mean, who knows whether the theta should be inside or outside. Um, I, I think... Uh, is something that we could, in principle, maybe uh, get an empirical handle on um, if we had the right kind of survey data and, you know, high frequency, you know, ask people um, how, uh, when, when their car breaks down, just how incredibly important is it. Uh, uh, apparently, as, as uh, we, were, we, we heard earlier, um, they do actually do whatever they need to do to keep that car. Uh, so, so the the degree of robustness to the detail of where you put the theta is an important thing I wonder about. The other thing I wonder about is uh, one of the um, agonizingly. Um, uh, um, uh, un unfortunate things about the beta delta framework is that it's very hard to know w how you know things will change when you go from you know a three period model to a annual model to a quarterly to a monthly to a weekly to a daily model um, do you have a sense of how hard it would be to solve uh, you know a uh, uh, instead of a three period to solve a life, lifetime uh, version of this and how sensitive the results on, say, the optimal size of the penalty might be to that. And I bet your answer is going to be, that's a great research project. Someone <laughs> should do it. <laughs> right, they're both great. I, I totally, those are great questions. So with theta, absolutely you're right that this is all for theta outside and theta inside is a totally different can of worms. Um, now, that raises another puzzle, which is, if we think that American households aren't saving enough in a precautionary account, given the volatility in income, think about how much more we should think they should be saving if we're going to take a theta and not just put it outside, but put it inside, which creates enormous value to liquidity. Then the kind of puzzles of inadequate liquid wealth just explode. So I'm prone to think that people aren't as crazy as these models would imply if we put theta inside and let theta have a lot of variation. But then you have this bizarre thing where you've got to calibrate it so it exactly isn't big enough to be bigger than current income. Because you've got this zero effect. Let me, let me embrace the agnosticism, which is we need, we need to do it both ways because we don't know where it goes. Um, and on the frequency, I've, I've thought about the issue of what, has, what happens when you go from 3 to n periods. And what you probably end up with there, though I don't have theorems, is, um, is accounts that are tied to particular consumption periods. And in essence, that's a lot like the DB annuity or some kind of annuity. So you retire and rather than getting the lump sum, you've got income coming every period. And of course, as, as you know, we're moving away from that system right now. Right now, the DB accounts are increasingly vanishing. And where there is a DB account in the US economy, there are increasingly lump sum options. 
And when lump sum options are offered, about 70% of the workers take the lump sum option. So DB is dead um, in terms of its annuity generation properties. Uh, and of course, these models kind of are suggesting that we're moving in the wrong direction. I think Raj, is, like, Raj has the sorry. So uh, I really like the optimal policy analysis, and I think the conclusions make a lot of sense. But I was wondering whether you've thought about the role of the private sector here. So for instance, why don't firms or financial companies offer these products if people want them? I love that question. That, that, that question's given me more heartburn in my life than any other question. Um, so I don't have a, I have like five answers, and none of them are satisfactory. Uh, answer one, uh, the US government actually kind of has a monopoly on the retirement saving system because we offer all of these tax benefits. So if a private firm came along and said, we're going to offer you a better non-ERISA retirement plan, it wouldn't be tax benefited. Uh, not in, in, and not be, they wouldn't be ERISA compliant, so no. I mean, the answer is the US government has set the rules, and if you deemed to break the rules, you would be not ERISA compliant, and you'd basically have a class action lawsuit. So that's, that, that's, that's one answer. There's another set of answers. Um, for naive agents, of course, you've got to do it through the planner because naive agents don't have demand for this stuff. Only sophisticates will have demand for this stuff. Um, there's also issues of signaling, which is when I go to someone else and say, give me a commitment account, I'm kind of you know, telegraphing my self-control problem, and there's a kind of adverse selection unwinding problem that can arise. I don't think those are, that, that's a big deal. Um, so another issue is commitment accounts, if they're gonna be optimal, often have to be contingent, and that creates another force against commitment, though in this case, you overcome that by making them non-contingent. So that's an argument for why um, anyone would offer a non-contingent account, not necessarily the government or a private sector individual. So there's, there's my list, but I do think we're struggling with the question. I mean, one, I think, fundamental critique of all of these frameworks, these self-control models, is why isn't there a more robust private market uh, beyond the personal trainers and the other kind of minor examples? Or why, to say it differently, do we have commitment everywhere in the economy, but it's never labeled as such? So a mortgage, financial planners will say, is a terrific commitment technology for building up net worth. But of course, banks don't advertise, we're going to tie your hands and force you to repay and make you wealthy. They just advertise lower interest rates. So I'm, I'm struggling with the question of why commitment per se isn't seen as something more desirable in a broader set of markets. In the um, post-Lehman period, right after, let's say, 2009, did, um, were, did a lot of people ask their congressman or whoever, let's say it's Australia or Israel where they have the, the annuation stuff, um, when, they, uh, when they take the money out and, uh, of your, say, uh, your uh, yearly income, did they ask them to, uh, to untie their hands? They said, we gotta give us legislation so we can borrow against the account, or allow us to, I don't remember a groundswell of people saying, I need liquidity, can you do something about the fact that I got this money tied up and you let me out without a penalty, or borrow against it? Right. No, you're quite right that, I mean, there's a big discussion taking place around the world about how liquid these accounts should be, and in England, right now, they have illi completely illiquid accounts, and the government's asked the question, maybe we should make them more liquid, and they've decided against that. Um, uh, I think they, you know, wrote a bunch of research papers, and I haven't read them all, but I think the conclusion was that it'll do more harm than good. That was... My understanding that is it was a policy conversation. The academics were, were peripheral to these decisions. Um, but it's, a, it's an open conversation. You know, many countries have gone the way of more compulsion and less liquidity, Australia. Um, the U.S. has gone the way of more liquidity. I don't know if you know this, but in the 1970s when ERISA, which is the retirement saving system, was set up, I'll, I'll ask you to guess, 
you think the Senate or the House wanted 30% penalties? The other body wanted the 10% penalty and they won. Which body do you think was, was more paternalistic and more prone to want the high penalty for early withdrawal from retirement savings accounts? The Senate, yeah, it's the Senate. Right? They're, the, they're the classical paternalists in American democracy. The House is the populist. So, there, so it is a conversation that's taking place, but you're right, it wasn't, there wasn't a hue and cry. I mean, the re, actually, the reality is in the US, these accounts are so liquid that Already. if you wanted the money, you could have it in 2008. Uh, In, in, a, in a forced saving system. I don't know the Israel. Yeah. That's the rule. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I need to look into that. Yeah. Oh, that's a good point. Um, we have to stop. Uh, we have. I, I mean, just very quickly, you actually saw the answer to this question in Adair Morris's presentation, where the uh, representatives in individual regions received tremendous pressure to make credit more available uh, because of the wealth differential. Right. The challenge in the United States, I would argue that this is purely a political challenge where your low beta populations tend to represent a, you know, minority populations, unfortunately, or income populations that unfortunately um, are disadvantaged and the solution tends to be support consumption rather than to support savings. It becomes a very political question as compared to an academic one. 